Hello, welcome back to another episode of Soul Sessions with Creative Mind. And we have a wonderful new series. We're starting a new series. And what is the series? <laughs> it's a bit tongue in cheek, but <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, it's did your parents really screw you up? Uh, we know in the culture there's a prevalent idea that our parents messed us up somehow. And therefore, we need therapy. <laughs> you know, there, there's something wrong with us because of the way we were raised. And uh, it, it's so prevalent that a lot of people haven't even thought about it. or They never question it, right? Mm. It's just ca- kind of assumed, I guess, from Freud, right? Uh, you it's need your to mother hate complex. Your, or... Yeah, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, this kind of idea pervades the culture that... Yeah, our parents screwed us up. Uh, we know a lot of us have experienced our parents divorcing, uh, different parenting styles mm. that go back uh, to the 70s, 80s, 90s. So Maybe earlier than that. Yeah, maybe earlier than that. So we wanted to do a series talking, looking at the evidence. Mm. For and against. For and against. Is there good evidence that our parents screwed us up? Can we blame them or <laughs> do we have to take responsibility? That's right. And so we're going to talk about bio- biology, DNA, genetics. We're going to talk about nurture nature, the argument. We're going yeah. to talk about parenting styles in an episode. And then also we're going to talk about the spiritual dynamics of a family, which is archetypal, which is going to be the last ep- uh, episode of the series. But today we're going to talk about DNA. And the topic is, can you blame your genes for your problems? Can you change your DNA? And if- can, are you stuck with what you have? And how much impact <laughs> yeah. DNA has on your life and decisions and well, we all know it has to do with our physical appearance. A lot of people, the blue eye, brown eye, uh, yes. maybe intelligence. But we're going to dig into that today. So let's start with what is DNA inheritance? Like wh- when you say inheritance, where are we getting? Let's go back to the beginning of time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're all related in, in that sense. And and all life on, pla- on the planet uh, is related Mm -hmm. we're actually all relatives including starfish in the ocean and humans and everything that is alive is related because it all goes back to these one-celled organisms that originate on the planet but what we're talking about is uh, the inheritance from our parents Mm. the genes that are passed down to us and so half your mother, half your father, yeah, your, your biological know, parents. Yeah, 23 pairs, uh, half of them come from your mother, half from your father. And the X and Y, right? The, mm. the Y comes from your dad, the X comes from your mom, and that determines your sex as well. Mm. But So we do have to blame our parents if we don't like the sex we, we were born into. Well, in a way, kind of like they're, they're I mean, not really. I mean, they don't have control over that. Yeah, I mean, that that's one of the factors, right? That if you say, well, I, I blame them for uh, my height, for example. If you're not happy with your height, I, I always wanted to be, a, you know, at least six feet tall. But I'm 5'10", which mm. is the average. It falls right on the middle. Uh, on, on, so... Being and I always wanted to be shorter. You wanted to be shorter, I'm right? the shortest person in my family. I'm 5'8". <laughs> you met my family. They're like Amazon. Like my brother's 6'4". My father was 6'2". Um, very tall. My mom was even 5'8 at one point. Now she's the shortest person because she's getting older. But yeah, I, like I always wanted to be more petite and tinier. And I was just the to- like a lot of times one of yes. the tallest. So can people. you do anything about that? That's one of the questions we're going to be mm. discussing. And, and also, can you blame your mom? for choosing your dad who is was tall mom what were you thinking (laughs) yeah we um so inheritance so i think one of the most surprising uh, concepts that you taught me is that we when we think of gna a lot of people think it's oh it's our physical biology so what i i color hair color body size body shape um tendencies like certain tendencies, uh, intelligence, uh, but I really, I didn't, and health, I didn't realize that personality was actually coded in the DNA, which I yeah. found that it maybe a lot of people knew that already, but I found that very surprising. 
We think our personality is something we create, you know, I I decide to be a certain way. Yeah, we can think of it this way. Almost everything has a genetic component. Mm. So what that means is it's not 100% DNA. In other words, your personality is not determined 100% by your DNA. But there's an important element that plays into your Mm. personality development that comes from your genes. And another thing that you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, is your spiritual like uh, interest or spiritual curiosity is genetic. It can be gen- part genetic. In, in part, yes. Because um, we think, well, religion, we're raised in a religion, we're taught how to experience God. But that alone is not the only element, because there's people that have not brought up with no religion, but are very mystical, and they they don't know why, but out of all their siblings, for some reason, they're the one that, you know, is picking up the tarot cards or going to, you know, reading books on spirituality or going to the Buddha center or taking yoga where everyone else in the family is just agnostic or uh, atheist. And it's just like, where did, the, where did she come from? I remember one of my cousins, um, when he was really little, all the people in the family, they weren't very religious. We were all Catholic, but they didn't even go to church. And their one son was like reading like Jesus books. And they were like, we don't know where he got this from because we don't talk about it. So right. that would be a genetic, uh, so like genetic something uh, impact. Maybe? Yeah. I mean, I think of it as like a seed. Mm. There's a seed of that spirituality in the genes and your mm. genetic inheritance. And then if, the environment, which we'll be talking about as well, uh, kind of uh, c- creates the conditions for the growth of that seed, mm. then you have that expression. Um, so let's talk about just the inheritance. What do, what do we know about inheritance? Yeah. So we know that uh, genetics, and, and when, you, when you take genetics and when you study the, uh, it's called behavioral genetics now, which is the the looking at genes and how they influence mental health, mental, uh, all kinds of uh, human behavior. When you study that, you start to think, oh my God, everything is, can be explained through the genes mm. because they're so powerful. Mm. Uh, but uh, we'll talk, let's say the environment we know plays an important role. You can't really understand genes unless you understand uh, the environment as well, the interaction with the environment. So it's part of the story. Part of the story, but it's a very important part. And especially now, because recently uh, we discovered that epigenetics is also uh, playing a big part in the way we act. Well, let's talk about what is epigenetics for people okay. who have never heard so, the term. So everyone knows about the chromosomes and and the genes that you get from your parents (laughs) now what what the genes are doing what what that genetic code is doing it's building your body it's the it's like Mm. a manual Mm. the blueprints for how are like every cell has that when it it has all the information for every part of the body and then it becomes specialized and then creates oh this this cell i'm going to be a liver so i have the code and the map to create. yeah the, the co- it's encoded in there yeah. that's why people can clone now mm. can clone animals and human beings because the the code contains all the information uh the color of your eyes the texture of your hair your height your intelligence your personality your propensity for diseases mm-hmm. all encoded in the genes given to you by your parents mm. now epigenetics what it does it as i go through my life then and i'm experiencing great things uh, education jobs opportunities but also traumas uh, as i go through heartbreaks mm. and maybe i experience a war you had a heartbreak or not, not me, but you know, <laughs> other people. people. I've heard people <laughs> experience those things. Uh, or you go through a war, right? Mm, like like uh, we're having now. Yes, uh, but but actually participate in it mm. or or get caught up in it. Yeah. The epigenetic code, is, and epi simply means above, so it codes on top of your genetics, uh, the epigenetic code. Uh, those experiences. So people who experienced were in the like camps at the Holocaust. Yeah. People who, well, really struggled. I know a lot of us have parents or grandparents that went through the Depression. And yeah. so the Great Depression, it was really a, a dark time. 
uh, there was like a lot of um, Wall Street fallouts and job losses. So these things that impact a, a natural disasters that happen. So those type of events will shape that person. So it might not be you that experienced the event, mm. but your family experienced it or someone down the line and created, activated something to cope with it or to like it activates something in the genetic code. Yeah, to- and that, that something is... It- is the gene it's in yeah, other words it, what, yeah. it turns genes on and off and so what do the genes do what would that would be their purpose yeah to turn so on? so uh, most of the most of our genes are actually dormant they're, mm-hmm. they're they used to think that oh they're not doing anything they're just kind of uh, left over from kind of like my closet from Some evolution of my genes are left in dormant <laughs> yes but but recently they found that no these genes are actually capable of waking up mm. at certain points so the the epigenetic code operates at that level it wakes up certain genes it turns them on and so they're able to kind of help you or hurt you depending on which ones get turned on and off or sh- sh- shutting off too at the same time yes wouldn't it shut off certain shut, genes yeah exactly uh, depending on your environmental experiences mm. so for example if, if your great grandparents went through a, a, a civil war mm-hmm. and and you know it gets encoded in the epigenetic code uh, meaning you're going to inherit that that epigenetic uh, code as well uh, then you experience some kind of violence in your society or your your, your personal experience. Uh, it might turn on genes that helped your grandparents survive those experiences. So Cope it helps you. Experience. It's kind of like a, a playbook, just in case this happens. Yes. Because oh. you're related, you it might be more uh, possible for you to experience a similar situation. Maybe that's yes. how the it, nature works. It makes sense, right, yeah. that, that their experiences help you now cope with similar situations Mm -hmm. so it's passed down and uh, people didn't know about this until recently they just they knew about the genetic code right which builds the body and the brain but they didn't know about this kind of understanding of the epigenetics which gives you a, a heads up about the environment and how to cope with it now on the other hand if your parents or great grandparents went through a famine mm. And and they experience severe uh, hunger mm. and, and uh, lack. Uh, that might be coded in the epigenetic code as well, and you inherit then a propensity to hoard food or something like that. That mm. that doesn't make any logical. Yeah, sense. The, the, yeah. You won't be able to find something in your personal experience, but it's coming from the this this epigenetic code. So I have a couple of questions. Number one is. We inherit these genetic uh, epigenetic codes. They don't necessarily have to turn on, but we have the p- potential for it to be on. Mm-hmm. And then can we create new epigenetic turn on and off codes during our lifetime? And does it affect us or it only affects our offspring or our you know future generations? Can so we- like it, in childhood, the epigenetics... Like say you, you're unique. You never had. You, there's no history of any ancestor who experienced famine. But in your childhood, there was like, a, a, you know, a war or something, and you were star- you were starving as a kid. It would activate or turn off epigenetics. But would that affect that person in that lifetime, or would it affect her or his children and grandchildren? So yeah. how fast? I, I guess my question is, how fast can you turn it around? It would, can you use them, you know, to to alter your experience? Do we know? Uh, well, you can't consciously do it. In yeah. other words, you can't say I'm going to code some epigenetic experience <laughs> for future generations. Yes. But your mind body will do its work, right? Yes, if but it's I mean, something would you feel an effect of that in your like if you had a, a epigenetic code turn on or off? You would experience that, even though you might not know that what's that is, but you would experience some kind of difference, or yes, and it would be showed up genetically, like if you went under, you not know, genetically, but uh, epigenetically. epigenetically. Yeah. So, can you read that through like a DNA test, or yeah. they, they uh, have, yes, they, they they see the these proteins that are markers on the genes, 
and that, that they turn these genes on and off. Mm. Uh, so we can experience them in directly in our lifetime. So Absolutely. And then our, our own personal experience may get coded in the epigenetic code mm. and then passed on to our uh, children and grandchildren. Mm. So when we talk about our childhood experience, is it, is it more prevalent to have the epigenetics turn on and off during childhood or throughout your life? Or is there a certain time? Like we know in psychology, it's under eight or nine. Uh, most of our conditioning was created and kind of baked in. But is what about epigenetics? Does that match that uh, psychology? Uh, I don't know. Mm. Uh, a lot of it is fairly new, and so all the smaller, subtle details has mm. haven't been worked out yet. Mm. Uh, but it's uh, it's been kind of verified right mm. we never say proven in, in real science it's uh, it supports mm. the theory of this epigenetic code playing an important role in human evolution and so when we talk about uh twin studies is this how they just de determine the epigenetics or um what what is that uh Research well, let, let's talk about genetics in, in okay. general, because the epigenetics is an important piece. But le, let's look at intelligence, for example, mm. as a kind of as an example, mm. because we know all these other factors play in personality, uh, uh, the social ability, social sociability, meaning introvert, extrovert, all yeah. that yeah, uh, comes from. So it's not your choice to be an introvert. <laughs> it's a genetic. Yes. Yeah. So intelligence, for example, uh, we look at two things. First of all, the distribution. Mm. And there's an incredible idea in, in statistics. It's called the normal distribution. And the normal distribution, like if you take any human characteristic to, let's say, height, it will fall uh, in this in this bell curve. Mm -hmm. It's like a, like a little hill or the shape of a bell, mm -hmm. meaning... Uh, there's a, like a peak where, mm -hmm. you know, where the bell kind of hangs on to the top and then it flares out at the bottom mm -hmm. with the two ends. Now, what that means is that most people fall in the middle. That's why it bulges in the center. It's like a hill, right? That about over 60% of the people fall within that middle range, meaning the average. Mm -hmm. But then you have people that are very tall. Mm -hmm. So there's a little tail towards the end on the right hand side and people that are very short, mm -hmm. which is the small tail in the beginning or the, the left hand side. Mm -hmm. So intelligence is very similar. Mm -hmm. If you test uh, enough people, you will get that bell curve where most people will be in the middle average intelligence with some people genius level and other people uh, mentally retarded. Right mm -hmm. on, on the other extreme, um, that trait we know is inherited, meaning you're mm -hmm. going to inherit uh, about half and half from your parents. Mm -hmm. Half of your, uh, let's say, it, the, your intelligence is, is an average of your parents' mm -hmm. intelligence, uh, and so that. What, where your particular score falls, that is called the variable. Mm. It varies. So if you test the, all your siblings. I'm the smartest. Not, <laughs> not everyone will have the, the same score, though. Mm -hmm. There'll be variability, right? Mm -hmm. That variance is what we're interested in. Because it tells us then, if you guys have the same parents, meaning... Mm -hmm. Both the, well, you share your parents' genes essentially 50-50 mm -hmm. from your mother and father. Uh, the variance ha has to do with the environment. Mm. Okay. Right? Something you learned. Or birth order too, could be. That's the environment essentially. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because it plays into uh, how you were treated, what kind of uh, attention you got. Only child, and then you have. Like my father was 18 years younger than his sister, so I can imagine they both had very different childhoods and the yes. parent being older versus younger. 
Yes. I mean, my sister's the youngest, and so she basically got away with a lot more than we did. You know, I think we always hear that in families. So th- there's just like a different level of freedom or tolerance. And, and so, so, all the, so the environment now is an important factor in your level of intelligence. Mm. And, and this goes for personality, for spirituality, all these other traits, right? They, so you inherit this propensity for a certain level of intelligence, but then the environment plays the, the role of bringing it forth, expressing mm-hmm. it, right? And, and either nourish, nourishing it and cultivating it or suppressing it. Mm-hmm. So that determines where your IQ score is, mm-hmm. right? that, okay. that variance. Um, the, the question then is, what is environment and what is uh, genetic. genetic? What is inherited and what is uh, the, the environmental role? That's the nurture, nature-nurture debate that's mm. been going on in psychology for a long time. So one of the ways we study that is twin studies. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have identical twins and they're separated at birth mm. and, and they're raised in different environments... Then you test them as adults, you know, and, and to see what is the variance between or the, the difference between their IQs. Mm-hmm. Then you can tease out what impact the environment had mm. because they I, uh, genetically they're identical, mm-hmm. but their environments were different. So you, you get a sense of what is the environment doing. And there's a lot of um, uh, studies where... Uh, twins were uh, separated uh, either through uh, marriage or splitting. You know, you take one child, I'll take the other. Um, but the one, uh, there was one where they're two brothers and they didn't know they were ha- there was a twin. They were both adopted out, and uh, which is kind of uh, common actually. There was a lot of, I guess, in, at a certain time, there was a, not a, much, a lot of money. So people who had twins, that would have been a big burden on a family. So they would give the babies up. And they would split the twins instead of keeping them together. <laughs> uh, and then they would look at them later on when they found reconnected. And there was one famous story where the, the, the men chose their wife, the same name of the wife. They chose the same, uh, without even meeting, without even talking, they chose the same type of career. They yeah. liked the same things. <clears throat> and then you had said that also they got married twice. And then the second wife had the same name, both of them. So it's amazing how much... Just genetics alone can drive our decisions, which is mind blowing. Yes, uh, genetics are very powerful, but the environment is powerful as well. Mm. So when we put it all together and we look at okay, so we inherit these genes and and you know from our parents and which tell us uh, how we're going to look, how we're going, how how tall we're going to be how intelligent we're going to be, our, our personality in a sense. And then we consider the environment, like what's what role is the environment having? Uh, with the school I go to, the teachers I get, the the type of education, mm-hmm. uh, the type of, of neighborhood that I live mm-hmm. in. And what do the kids do? Uh, are they interested in reading or are they interested in uh, doing drugs, right? They, yeah. they Or doing other things <laughs> culture language yeah. uh television mm. what's going on in the culture uh, in the family right in the family as well so all those things play a big role as in in kind of shaping uh our intelligence our behavior our health um all the partners that we choose all mm. these different things so when we boil it down to okay what percentage of of our behavior is controlled or, or influenced, dictated. dictated by genes, and what percentage is dictated by environment? It's it falls to about forty percent. Forty percent of the variance is genetic, mm. and forty percent environmental. So the twenty percent is chance. Then twenty percent, the the twenty percent that's left over, is complete. Up Random for grabs. <laughs> yes. Wow. So we have a 20% chance to break our patterns from our family? 
Yes. But it, that's a big percentage. I mean, we think it's, it's not small. It's not like 1%, 20% is... That's right. I, it, it is part of the universe because uh, the uncertainty principle mm -hmm. is b baked into everything. It's the creative mind. It's the creative element. Uh, mm. We know genes, for example, go through mutations randomly. Mm -hmm. They go through these random mutations. Uh, so there's always that element of chance playing into our inheritance and the environment as well. But that 20% of variance, of chance variance, uh, saves our ass because <laughs> that means we're not stuck. Mm. Whatever we inherited from our parents genetically and whatever our environment was, we're not stuck to that. We can choose within that 20% to, 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 to essentially say, what are we going to make out of these experiences? So a lot of, you know, I've seen people floating around this idea of looking at your DNA and all that is that something i mean we have like uh, ancestry 24 and me you can mm. learn a lot about yeah. yourself they i you know i we did it and i'm 30 percent irish i was shocked <laughs> i was like wow i didn't <laughs> have that much irish in me but uh but it was it's really interesting there there's this sort of like heaviness to that there's a science behind you know like it's solid but i love this idea of beyond even just our experience in life, which a lot of us who do personal development, we're always talking about our early life experiences or ex traumas or events that happen in our life that shaped us. But that 20%, can genetics tell a, help a person uh, or dictate how, how open a person is to change? Yeah. So, so someone who has more like a, a warrior um, uh, disruptive kind of gene, like that kind of uh, taking chances risk, Versus someone who tends to play it safe. That's, that would be genetic, but yeah. also environment. Right, because that's part of personality. Ah. So yeah. one of the big five uh, mm. uh, kind of measures of personality mm -hmm. is openness. Oh, yeah. And if you're open, you mean it means you're more creative, uh, more social. So the big five is really a combination of genes and environment. Yes. Your, your personality. That's right. It, it would fall... Uh, kind of on in, in this uh, pattern that 40% of your personality comes from your genes mm. and about 40% comes from your environment, the your experiences, your education. Uh, but then that 20% chance mm. is what what creates that diversity of personalities, mm. right? You so you that's see why people, the siblings are different. And that's right. And you see people that go through very similar experiences and come out completely different mm -hmm. because that 20 percent wiggle room allows us to make decisions for ourselves so some people could have a genetic disposition or and even the environment grow up in a very positive household and they gen genes are about willingness to be open and all that but they could still have a 20 percent chance of being scared you know like um not act upon that yes that's it so, or, or the opposite, where they're genetically uh, predisposed to be more conservative, more um, closed down, uh, maybe shut out. But that 20% is like, I'm breaking free. So my question to you now is, how can we unlock that 20%? How can we use that 20% to break free? I mean, we're, we can't get rid of our genetics. I mean, we're not going to magically change our eyes, color, eyes of our, uh, color of our eyes. Uh, or the early life experience, but we could change our attitude toward it. We can change um, how we relate to now and now today. How, how do we do that? Yeah, so if you think about uh, how our minds work, uh, as human beings, we're able to think forward, like uh, to run the movie forward, and we think about what would the consequences of this behavior be? Mm-hmm. And we, we kind of imagine different scenarios and we think, okay, I don't want to do that because it's too risky or yes, I'm going to take this chance because I think it's, it's going to work out. And it's all done mentally. Mm. So we can think in terms of creating our own conditions. Mm. If, it, if the environment is 40% of potential in us, 
So we're really dealing with 60% and exactly. really stuck. The genetic is... Well, not, well, no, not but, stuck, but... Well, not even there because... Is epigenetics? No, because... Well, yes, because of epigenetics, but also neuroplasticity. Oh, okay. Yes. That so we, talk about that. A we're little. able to mold and reshape our physical brain as well as our body. I mean, you see people that go to the gym and transform themselves completely, right? Or lose weight or, or uh, become marathon runners mm -hmm. uh, and and just, uh, they all, they do go it. Go beyond through, the odds. Yeah, so. through their mind. Hey, yeah, we always hear of these people that beat the odds. Mm -hmm. It's because of that 20%. It was, let's say it's, that's the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. That there's a chance uh, to change the patterns. But then where where does it stop? Because like you say, there's more than 20% because the environment mm. that they're creating now, going to the gym instead of going to McDonald's. So uh, if you think about hanging out with people that uh, go to the bar and eat fried foods and they don't exercise and that's part of your lifestyle, you're more likely to stay in that unhealthy lifestyle. But then you start hanging out with people at the yoga center and the gym, and you have friends and that talk about health, and uh, or you're around that. It's mm. a different scenario. Absolutely. So you have a different experience. You're creating the conditions for your own growth. In other words, you're creating your own environment. You know, I was thinking this earlier. Um, the concept of money, uh, I think, over the past 15, 12, 15 years, my concept of money has completely changed. Mm -hmm. And that is really being in an environment of people that are entrepreneurial, that are thinking about money differently than someone who punches a time card. So there's something there too about epigenetics turning on and off, like that 20% chance that you aren't locked into the fate of your past or even your culture, or your family of you know, you grow up in a poor family, you're meant to be poor or working class forever. Or you grow up even in a rich family, you could lose everything, you know, and, and blow it, the money. But this idea that you can actually create and change something so um, intangible, like how do you how do you move your mind to that? It, I thought that was, I was just thinking about that today, how, how different, how I think about what I spend my money on, how yeah. what we... What we think is valuable, what we don't think is valuable, and where does money come from, and what's possible. So even just money, and and th so think about the body with health, what's possible. Like someone tells you, you have. Uh, my dad was uh, diagnosed with uh, leukemia. He went through chemo. The first time it didn't work. The second time he said, "I only have a twenty percent chance," which is interesting, twenty percent. And I said, "Well, they didn't tell you zero." And he said, well, that's a good point. I said, you're going to be one of those 20%. Just hold your mind. And my he was in an environment of someone who can hold that vision for him. And I'm, I promise you, his mind was impacted by, instead of having everyone tell him, you're, you know, it's terrible, terrible, to have someone say, it's possible. And my mom was there and we were all like rooting for him. I think that also creates health, don't you think, in recovery? So when we think about our physical bodies too, money, our physical bodies, relationships, what's possible for us? What kind of relationships can we have? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about early experiences, the way they play out is that your our, our, our mind and our brain, they work in the, with the principle of expectation. So if you have an enriched environment, early on, meaning mm. there's a lot of books, there's a lot of puzzles, a lot of ex activities that uh, teach you that you're learning new uh, novel things continuously. Your brain says, the rest of my life, I have to prepare for this continual growth. Mm. So, so you're building the road, uh, the highways? It anticipates, right? It, mm. it, it, it is expecting to grow already. Mm. So you're approaching life already from being a child with this growth mindset, mm. the, this mentality of growth, the possibility of moving forward. And fascination, creativity, curiosity, yeah, curio imagination. Yes. Uh, the ability to learn mm. how to learn. Well, some people, uh, they think take things at face value. They're very pragmatic and they, they've they learned maybe that because through their family that I, show me before I believe it. And then there's other people that have that natural uh, creative uh, 
tendency in their mind to just imagine and have fantasies and all those mm-hmm. things. So I think um, that comes from part genetics, but also that 20% chance. Yes. And then, so so like we were saying, it's more than 20% because once you take that opportunity and, and change your mindset, and you, you, instead of saying, um, my life was pretty rough, or my teachers told me I would never learn, or that they told me I have ADHD or a learning disability. And if you believe that, right, if you say, what what's the use of me trying if I if my genes and my environment have set me up for failure and I never try, then that becomes your your stuckness essentially. You, that's as far as you go. But if it, because of that 20% uh, openness, if you say, I choose not to believe a prediction mm-hmm. that doesn't empower me, it doesn't give me any opportunity for growth, for advancement, I just refuse to believe it. Mm. I'm going to make my own opportunity. So you believe in your your dream versus what the the current circumstances are showing you. That's right. And, and we know that principle operates yeah. in psychology and coaching mm-hmm. in philosophy that whatever you expect comes about. Yes. And if your mind resonates with people who uh, who you, you, you end up resonating with your belief system. Yeah. So if you believe in lack, it, you'll tend to feel more comfortable around lack. But if you surround yourself with people who have abundant thinking and possibilities, that will shift. So would you say that the best way, if you wanted to unlock your potential, change your environment? Would that be the, like the first step? One of the first steps or no? I would say change your mind. Well, and your environment as well. Like, uh, at the same time, if you're if you are working towards something, a vision, mm-hmm. and you're holding your mind in that possibility, yes. wouldn't it be it's it's helpful to have a nurturing environment for yourself, be around people who are thinking like you, who can basically help you lift you up, and in a community that thinks like you, thinks in possibility. Yes, it helps because it reinforces then those thoughts of possibility. Whereas if you have a, a possibility, let's say you have a vision, but you're surrounded by people that always boo it and then don't encourage you or don't support you, uh, then the likelihood of you succeeding is very low mm. because the environment is not supporting your vision. Yeah, I mean, you can work a lot on your mind, but if everyone around you is telling you, what are you doing? Why are you doing your own business? Go back, get a job, be like a real person. Don't go for your dreams. You know what a chance for you to make it mm-hmm. is one in a million. You know, if you're around that noise after a while, you it's like you can fight it for so long, but the the body and the mind works much better in an environment that is saying it's possible. We see this a lot with people. They'll go to an event we have when we used to do live events or do our training, and then they'll go back into the world and they kind of those who check out of the community they don't check in they kind of go off and they're kind of lost and and it's like they come back and it's like they they see the power of being in the conversation of that possibility versus being with the ordinary people that don't have big dreams and we really the dream stealers as i call them (laughs) because everyone really we're conditioned to be mediocre we're conditioned for survival we're not conditioned to do the impossible and that's why so many so little people actually live that full meaningful life because we're so impacted by that environment but we have first of all make a decision to change to to change our life have that vision in our mind of what we want to create and then you you know work with our mind but also find someone it's like a a fertile ground like a beautiful uh, flower that you want to plant you don't want to plant it in a dry bed you want to plant it where there's water and where there's rain and there's you know nutrients and so it can grow so that's also very important but you'll find wouldn't you say that uh if you're in an environment that's negative it's also reflecting your mind and you have to kind of come to terms with that part of that that environment that's pulling you down or yeah, like a, re- a marriage or um, uh, friendships. and Yeah, you almost get into that ch- chicken and egg uh, mm. situation with the, the genes and the environment mm. uh, because they don't exist separately. Mm-hmm. 
the you, you always see genes being expressed in an environment mm -hmm. and the environment then uh, prompts certain genes to wake up and to be activated mm -hmm. so it's never isolated you can't think of the environment and just the as genes the only thing. separate well you can't it, like go in and it's change an interaction your genes. yeah it's an interaction that's what we're talking about mm. the interaction between our genes and the environment but since you can't really go in open up your cells and change your dna the environment is not yet uh, oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> watch out but the environment yeah. is really the first like it would be something to first just a first step for people is am i in an environment that is cultivating helping me cultivate my dreams that's part of it yes but the not the only thing no yeah. i would say the mind because thoughts uh uh they don't cost anything. Uh, in other words, if I'm in lack and in poverty in a, in a, in a poor neighborhood, uh, it doesn't cost me anything to imagine and to have a vision. Mm -hmm. I can do it, you know, just spontaneously. So already I'm starting to shift my own perception yes. by shifting my mind. So that's the beginning of it. Then I can look for you'll be drawn to a certain different environment right yes. you'll, you'll be like I, I feel like i need new friends or That's, i'm more inspired by different people and yeah. and environment also is like what you watch on television what kind of movies you watch what books you read um what where with the senses what are they pulling in food you eat all that is environment that yeah. you can change uh eating healthy food is even if you don't not doing it to lose weight is like honoring the vessel of your soul to keep it yeah. Keep it alive as long as you can and healthy and fit. Yeah. And we know it's not easy. Some mm -hmm. people, because let's say their IQ, their IQ falls, uh, let's say, or they, their genes might be on the lower end mm -hmm. of the scale uh, as far as intelligence, and then they have an uh, impoverished environment, their, their trajectory towards success is going to be a lot more difficult than somebody who's on the other side, mm -hmm. right? They... They got good genes and the, their environment is supportive. Uh, their track is a lot easier, but it's it's always possible because of that twenty percent chance opportunity. Mm. Those are opportunities. In other words, there's there's things that are going to happen to us that fall outside of those parameters, yeah. and then it's up to us to take advantage of them to say. What's possible for me? What can I do with these opportunities? And that's how people work them, them their way out of poverty, out of lack, out of uh, limitation. Mm -hmm. And IQs actually increase. People mm -hmm. can actually increase their intelligence by taking action. And so the desire to change yeah. is the first and then the using your mind to figure out how to work with your mind how to understand yourself especially unconscious as Jung talks about the shadow facing your shadow and knowing that you're not the personality or genetic biological component that there's another self that's true and unlimited and and uh, and seeing yourself beyond that container that we're yes. experiencing the world so looking at the all the evidence here as far as genes and environment can we blame our parents? No. Well, because it's, is it the parent? It's not our parents' <laughs> DNA. It's like DNA from generation after generation mm. after generation after generation. And they didn't consciously say, ooh, I'm going to make her eyes blue, and I'm going to make him smarter, and I'm going to make her have uh, you know, some kind of uh, learning disability. The parents... Really, and a lot of moms, I think, do blame when their kids have it. Mm. I, you, know, you worked a lot with learning disabilities when you were doing yeah. child psychology uh, psych, uh, as a child psychologist. The parents will often blame themselves in a way. Didn't well, not the only mother? the parents blaming themselves. There was actually a theory called the refrigerator mother. Oh yeah, which blamed the mother for autism, um, and, and this was up until the eighties. In the uh, mid '80s, it was still going on. Uh, people thought it, the child is autistic because the mother is cold. Mm. That's why that's where the term came from, the refrigerator mother. And of course, we found out later that's not Thank God. that's not true. Yeah. Uh, that's not what is happening. There, there are strong genetic components to autism. And then environmental factors as well. And also a lot of the treatment just 
even just autism, people think that's so it's genetic and it's, you know, a life sentence. But there are a lot of uh, behavioral um, processes that help the, the child really uh, change and adapt and speak and, and uh, find a way to function at a higher level. They're, they don't just like give up on them. Yeah, we know social environment is very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, again, because if you think about the, the, the numbers, it's equal to the genes. Mm. So the environment is important as well as the genes. Mm. So if there's a genetic component, you can offset it with enriched environments. Mm. Environments that support the growth and development of their mind and brain. And we do, we cannot change our eye color <laughs> or hair color, but we can adjust, change the body uh, in ways to be healthier. And, um, and uh, everyone's different with their genetic, what foods they, they based on their uh, his ancestry. A lot of times certain ancestry backgrounds have a tendency for certain types of food. Yeah. For me, Irish, <laughs> like, like the wine and the beer and the uh, potatoes. I love potatoes. Where you don't, that's not part of, that wasn't part of your culture. So we have this kind of, and then we, we can uh, um, digest and, and process different foods differently. Yes. And some people have asked us about, uh, can you change your genetic code? Mm -hmm. uh, because there are programs out there that talk about changing your gen genetic code and to make money <laughs> and changing, rewiring your brain, those kind of things. And it's yes and no. Uh, because technically they're not wrong. You can change the wiring in your brain, meaning the, the physical structure of your brain can actually change through meditation, through exercise, through learning. puzzle solving. All learning is essentially a changing of the brain. So your brain has changed from this episode, just listening to new information. Your brain is changed. Like yeah. we're, It's constantly Change. Rewiring. Rewiring, yeah. yes. Uh, the genes, it's a little bit more iffy, but... Yeah, I guess you could say, well, uh, if you experience something profound, like walking through fire or going on a, a beautiful trip, an adventurous trip, it, it might activate certain epigenetic codes or, or suppress others, mm -hmm. uh, like anxiety or something like that. But the, the science is not really there to be able to control it. Mm -hmm. to, you know, if people are saying... We're going to rewire your brain to think. Uh, be more confident. Yeah, be more confident or be more, uh, be richer or make more money or something like that. I think that's a little hypey. You know, <laughs> it's getting into the realm of uh, more sales. Pseudoscience. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah. definitely not not scientific because it, the science is not really there uh, for that kind of control. We don't, con so it happens that we do have this adjustment, but we can't control what turns on. Like you were saying one time, uh, one more uh, kind of idea of this is that there's the same genetic code for the lips as uh, or the eyes. There was some kind of, they were trying to make an adjustment to the DNA, like kind of doing tests and you were like, it's the same. There's like a... Remember you told me about that? Oh, that, that was so long ago. <laughs> you don't remember? I, I don't remember. But you were that. like, it was a psychological experience mm -hmm. that was changed or uh, preconditioned. And then it also, that gene affects the lips, like the sealing of our, you know, our um, opening into our mouth and our eyes. Yeah, the, the, so there's like one gene can have can work on a lot of different parts psychologically and physically and so you're playing around with genes like oh i'm going to turn this on and turn this off you're you're kind of messing with nature in a, in a way it, yeah it's very interactive uh, mm. like there's not one gene for a certain thing mm. it's usually a hundred or two yeah so genes that play into that particular behavior and so you can't really say we're going to change that gene and you're going to miraculously be changed. So um, what we want to do is say you have to work with your mind. There is a possi there's possibility you're not locked into the past environment, past biology. There's a 20% chance, but also by ch you working with your mind and even chance encounters, chance events. I mean, even a tragedy sometimes 
brings out something in someone, you know, like I didn't have a purpose and then I got in a car accident and, you know, lost my legs. And now I'm like, you know, feeling the zest for life, maybe not that severe, but a lot of times you lose someone and you, you have this kind of profound shift in your life. So that mm-hmm. would be something that we're, it's not genetic and from early life, but some event happens and it kind of profoundly changes you. Yeah, the the message is this. Never give up because there's always an opportunity. Mm. If you're alive and you still have a chance to do something, to think, to uh, to move somehow, uh, there's an opportunity to change. And it, that's the nature of, of life, right? Mm-hmm. It's always changing, adapting. And so our task is simply to to cooperate with it cooperate with that change and play into it instead of buying into whatever like diagnosis yeah. or, or limitation uh, we we observe or others uh, tell us that you know you can't do that like my father he said they said only 20 percent, and he was everyone around him was like sad and you know, you know, sorry. And I said, and I was like, Nope, <laughs> no, that's 20% pot, you know, think yeah. that's great. Like, look at that as a positive. And so really like shifting your attitude toward what happens versus whatever happens, just reacting to it from that default place is to stretch your mind and say, where's the opportunity here? No matter yeah. what happens to you, there's always an opportunity. That's right. So, um, great. Um, this is really interesting. And so next week, we're going to talk about um, environment, nurture, nature a little more yeah. and uh, family culture and how that really makes an impact on our, our personality. And um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting conversation. And to see if we can blame our parents for this. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> let, we, so now we know we can't blame our parents in this episode. Let's try again. We're going to look at nature and nurture. Can your early life environment shape your life as an adult? Um, can we blame our parents? Uh, find out next week <laughs> the case for and against. So take care. And don't forget to uh, subscribe to us if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're wa- listening to our podcast, subscribe to uh, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, all the uh, podcast services out there. Make sure you don't miss an episode. We, we drop them every week and have delicious topics like this one and we'll continue the series next week so have a wonderful wonderful day evening whatever time of day it is thanks for watching have a wonderful life see you soon